I'm Jeff Stukely. I work in Austin, Texas doing power hardware. I've been doing that for about, I don't know, 20 years or so as a kind of microprocessor architect guy. And uh, this discussion here is about OpenCAPI. It's our new sort of I.O. attachment protocol. But uh, it's been a bit of an interesting transition. Back when I first started doing work, all the focus was on cache coherence, um, really a lot of things inside of the computer using general purpose computing. But over the last five years in particular, um, a huge part of my focus has transitioned towards accelerator attach, heterogeneous computing, and uh, standards to attach to our computing infrastructure. So this one is uh, OpenCAPI, which is an, a new standard um, to connect devices to our processors. And the, the important part here, which maybe isn't going to be obvious, but I'll, I'll stress it right away, is the open part like Ming just talked about open power, which is that's openness around the power ecosystem. We've actually gone more broad with open CAPI, which is open towards any architecture. And so essentially what we're building here is something that works with, it could, really could be anything. It could be ARM, it could be AMD, it could be any number of these processors. And so it's a, definitely, a, a, it's more than just power, it's beyond power and what we're, what we're trying to, to attach to. So what is it? Uh, I'm I just using the term device attach here. You know, you think about PCIe. PCIe has network behind it. It has um, storage behind it in a lot of ways. It has accelerators. But it doesn't have main memory, right? If you have a computer today and you want to put main memory behind it, which you do loads and stores to, it just doesn't work across PCIe. And so uh, with this interface, though, we want a standard, a, a device attached that lets us talk to everything, right? So I don't want to say an I.O. bus because this is really broader than an I.O. bus, right? And so the other side of it, what are we doing with it? So we want to be able to attach memory. And when I say memory, I mean, you know, low latency DRAM all the way up to storage class memory. We want to be able to attach accelerators. That could be FPGAs. We have a bit of work in attaching low cost ASICs to our part. So we want to have Really, all of these devices network, do a lot of work with Mellanox on these type of topics. So we want to be able to take, we build this low latency interface and put all those devices on one common interface. And there's a lot of value in putting them all on one common interface because I can build a microprocessor chip that has 128, 256 lanes of connectivity. And then based upon what I'm trying to build, I could use all those lanes for DDR. I could use some fraction of those lanes for accelerators, right? But it gives me a, a, a lot of flexibility when I build a system that I just need one I.O. design, and then I can put sort of everything behind that one I.O. design. So lots of powerful capability. So latency, we're talking in the tens of nanoseconds. When we talk about attaching DRAM, we're looking at more like five nanoseconds because there's some special properties of DRAM that lets us get even less latency. Uh, bandwidth, we're starting out at 25 gig differential signaling with a view towards 32, 56 gig going forward. But 25 gig is where we're kind of at initial version. And then you've got flexibility. This is this point I already made, which is sort of one interface to rule them all, right? Everything can all go behind this one interface. So to draw a little bit of picture of that, and, and since this picture is drawn, our, our thoughts have changed a little bit here. You'll see you know, standard memory, which is something we like. It's low cost, right, traditional. Standard JETIC DDR modules are, um, you know, a cheap way to buy memory. But we've sort of changed our thinking a little bit. We put advanced memory here as something that detaches. But the more and more we work on this, on this project, we think that maybe we can make these things more common, which is what I was talking about earlier. So, but, so you've got your CPU, and then your CPU has a bunch of these open CAPI lanes coming out of it, and then you can attach accelerators, GPUs, um, FPGAs with arbitrary accelerators, ASICs, uh, network controllers, low latency networking interface, um, and then you know memory. This could be storage class memory controllers, broad, broad range of devices. And then that guy sits in the data center, and then everybody has you know, the capability to accelerate things. There are a lot of these acceleration standards. I don't need to name them. But one thing we're doing which is very unique with OpenCAPI compared to other standards is we're trying to move complexity from the accelerator onto the host silicon. 
So uh, one thing that happened a few years ago, Intel had FPGAs that talked QPI. So you have an FPGA talks QPI, that means that that FPGA has to have all of the IP to talk QPI embedded on the FPGA device. Right, that was a symmetrical protocol where you'd take out a CPU socket, put in an FPGA. But you just burden that FPGA with understanding Intel QPI coherence protocol, which meant a couple things. One, you have very limited choice in FPGAs because there's only one. And that also meant the FPGA was expensive because you had to pay Intel for the IP. Right? And you also had poor isolation. Um, if the FPGA happened to have a, a failure or crash, you have to take the whole system down because the expectation of that coherence protocol was you know, put on equally amongst the processor and the FPGA. So what we think, um, you know, the IBM group and really the broader Open CAPI Foundation members is that you need to put, make the accelerator as simple as possible and as architecture agnostic as possible to enable quick development of devices and then take all the complexity as much as you can and put that on the host silicon. And what this does is there's going to be a limited number of host devices, right? Maybe we'll end up, let's just say, three host devices. So we can go off and optimize those ho three host devices. We can hide all the complexities and all the optimizations of what's different between those host devices. And then the accelerators themselves can have an extremely simple protocol. And so this is uh, very important to what we're thinking we want to do. And it also is unique compared to some of the other um, proposals that are floating around in the world in this area. So, um, so latency is very important, especially when you look at attaching um, things like main memory and load store access to devices. And the differences here are quite dramatic. So we've already built, uh, I mentioned, a 10 nanosecond device. So if you look at a Power 8 server today, we have something that's very similar to an open CAPI buffer chip. We have this custom chip we built. It uh, contains a 16 megabyte cache. 40 DDR ports. So we talk with a 9.6 gigahertz signaling to this big buffer chip we made and then have four ports of DDR across it. And we're able to do that all within really a 10 nanosecond adder of traditional DDR. But what all did we do in that 10 nanoseconds? We had a 16 megabyte cache we looked up on our buffer chip. Um, we had four DDR ports, so this was a very large buffer chip. Um, and, and we've learned from that as well, right? So I take what we did in that design, which is a Power 8 thing, so three years old, and a lot of the ideas we developed in building low latency device attach, right? And then we said, okay, I want to do more than just do a, a load store slave. I want to be able to master commands and a variety of other things we've built into the protocol. And so um, another point, just to be clear here, PCIe is in the hundreds of, you know, hundreds of nanoseconds, and it's really unclear why, why talking across wires has to take so long. So if I look at just my 30s and how much latency is in my 30s, you can build low latency 30s in this sort of five nanosecond range, right? We talk between processor chips at this very low latency. We talk between memory and processors at very low latency. There's really no reason that, that you have to have a high latency once you go on copper wires. And so one thing to think about here is how does this compare to integrating a bunch of things on the same chip? which is another option, right? If I wanted to have low latency to between two devices, I'd put them all on an SOC, just like it sits in your cell phone. So what's good about that, well, you only need one chip, and theoretically you have low latency between you know, different parts of that same chip. But the maybe not obvious thing is that you really can build low latency between two different pieces of silicon. And by putting your accelerator on a different piece of silicon than your processor, the benefits are very obvious, right? You can have a, a, a silicon that's optimized for the particular accelerator, you decouple development cycles, right? Instead of trying to have to spin an SOC to put different combinations of accelerators, maybe it works in your phone or your watch, but in the data center, that's not really viable. And so the, the key thing to think about, though, is the latency to cross, to leave a chip and go to another chip, and really the power to do the same so is, is really quite reasonable, right? When you think about the overall end-to-end -end scale of things. And so, um, so essentially what we did was we took you know, what we did before and then we essentially added the ability to master commands, interrupts, and, and a variety of other things. So we have a variety of, hopefully these build charts work correctly. So what kind of things are we talking about supporting here? You've got sort of the basic example here 
where you've got an accelerator and you're doing offload. This could be doing compression, it could be um, you know, scanning through data that lives in memory. Right, so this is the basic accelerator offload. I guess GPUs would fall into this as well. You can have memory here, and so you send it to the GPU, chugs on it for a while, comes back. Beyond that, um, you can go ahead and process data as it's leaving the system, right? So I'm sending data to um, storage, I want to compress it, right? I want to encrypt it. That's a fairly straightforward thing to do. And the nice thing about being on a different chip, separate from the processor, is you can put this on a card, and that card can have tail stock that goes off and talks to the world, right? Which is different than putting an FPGA on a processor module, on a multi-chip module, where you don't really have the ability to customize your solution, right? So this lets, by having this cable, which is essentially how many of these solutions work, you put it on a card, and that card you can do whatever you want. So lots of flexibility. Um, other things going in the other direction, clearly. This is sort of the analogous to, the, to going out, coming in, you can do the same thing. Right? You can process data as it arrives. But a bit, a bit more interesting as well is let's pretend you have, like you're trying to do some massive hash join on a bunch of data that's sitting in a disk. You can build your hash table, stick it in main processor memory, and then stream through data um, from disk or storage and do the computations that, that you know, accesses your data structure is essentially combining um, your, your accelerator is combining data and, and host memory, combining it with data that's streaming from, say, SSDs attached to the device, and then going off and searching for patterns and, you know, large queries across large sets of data. And maybe, you know, this is says, you know, we can we kind of do it all, right? So these are sort of, you know, building charts here, but clearly there's, there's quite a few different paradigms that we can support with this whole, whole mechanism. And that didn't build right. Yeah, I was worried about that. <laughs> so, um, but this is talking memory here, where you got DDR memory. That's one way, one thing you can do here. Um, the next solution is you could attach storage class memory. By storage class memory, I mean you know like uh, phase change memory or things like that, where you know you have load store access to it, but you have a mix of memory in your system. Maybe you plug together some direct attached memory, some persistent memory, right? Based upon what you're trying to build. You can mix any combination of these things. But another fa fairly obvious solution is um, a tiered solution, right? I could put DDR memory, and then OpenCAPI can be daisy-chained as a protocol, right? There's nothing that prevents you from building switches or doing a sort of daisy chain protocol. So I could take all of my DDR memory, and I could build in a fast uh, page swapping device. So potentially transparent to my processor here, I could put a cache of DDR memory and then put a large set of phase change memory or storage class memory behind it and build in sort of a transparent paging model. So all these things are, any of these three things you do here, they all can be made transparent to the processor, right? You use the same pins, you decide what you want to build, and these are all the different use cases you can do. Uh, just to focus on this buffer thing here, I, I tried to shrink this picture, I realized it was huge. But how do you build a buffer with, say, five nanoseconds of additional latency by being buffered memory? Um, the nice thing about the open CAPI protocol, and I talk a little bit about this, is we do things quite differently with how CRC and framing and all those things work. But essentially, we can take raw data from the CERTES before we've even checked the CRC to, to see if it's a valid, you know, error-free command. And you can go ahead and send an activate out to DDR memory. So DDR you can go off and open a bank, and when you open a bank in DDR, let's just pretend you had an error in the particular packet you looked at. If you go and open up the wrong bank, it doesn't hurt anything, right? It's non-destructive. And so this, when I mentioned like special attributes of DDR memory um, that let us have low latency, that's one of them, right? I have non-destructive ability to go off and read things. Um, the other side of things is DDR memory has, you know, predictable latency. And so, I can go off and send my data responses ahead of the data, and then the data can come straight off my DDR5, cross the chip, and go straight to my processor. Um, so you can see how with a small chip, you can, this is how simple the protocol can be. You can just read the data, decode the command, the commands are always in a certain spot, send it straight through the chip. So this is how we can build low latency uh, memory buffers with this solution. So, um, and, and what are some of the things we do in here? 
it's, uh, it's different than PCIe. And I have coming up in a couple slides kind of a, a view of what things look like on the interface. But we've put things in very specific slots and with specific templates. Um, you can almost, almost think of it as like a, a VLIW-like architecture. So in VLIW, instructions all went in different spots. There's maybe different templates of what the valid instructions were. We're doing the same thing as we send the operation across the high-frequency link. When it's decoded in the destination device, the, the, the particular flits are aligned to the clock frequency of the receiver, and commands are always in the same spots. And devices can actually choose which templates they want to support. So if somebody wants to build a very simple device that only handles one command per cycle, that command will always show up in exactly the same wires when it enters the, the, the accelerator chip. And you can essentially police that, where you can say, I only want to support these particular templates because those are the ones I care about, and an accelerator. So this is all about building an extremely simple accelerator that doesn't really have anything other than credit management at the destination device. So how does this help with, there's a couple of things that help with host scalability. So if I'm going to build a processor chip that has extremely large number of lanes of, of, of of, of capacity here, I need to have low cost on my processor side as well. And if I look at just uh, PCIe, for example, um, the PCIe host has a lot of complexity in it, but it also has a lot of down backward compatibility type aspects to it. And so things that you have to do in PCIe is you need to be able to run it Gen 1 or by 1. You have to be able to train your way up to these high frequency devices. And if we just put devices that only support 25 gig, we can put a lot, the, the power per lane is much lower. The other thing is PCIe has these complicated ordering rules, right, that are sort of legacy-based ordering rules, and that makes streaming data at high bandwidth from a PCIe device difficult. You have to expose all of your writes in specific orders. That, you know, there's a couple different ways to do it. Intel has one way to do it. We have another way we do it, but it's not easy for either of us. And so instead of taking PCIe and trying to make it run faster, this says, well, let's make the ordering rules much more explicit. Where the accelerator says, you know, I care about this, I don't care about this. It can indicate everything needs to be in order, but keep in mind, to get high bandwidth, you really need to not say every single write I do needs to be in order. Um, so that's kind of how we build host scalability is we enable accelerators to indicate only what needs to be ordered and not everything being ordered. There is a bit of you know, partial ordering in PCIe devices, but it, it doesn't necessarily work that well. So, um, so virtual addressing, uh, this is an important aspect as well. If, if you're going to build an accelerator, you want to have it using the same address space as the processor, right? Because then you can look at a data structure in the accelerator, and if somebody put a pointer you know, in their data structure, pointers are quite common, you'd like the accelerator to be able to interpret and understand that pointer at low cost. Right, fairly basic stuff. So you know, that's what we've done with, we did that with CAPI, but that continues with Open CAPI. Um, one other interesting thing about um, here is we've moved translation. So a lot of the translation infrastructure going between virtual addresses and the actual physical address, there's a lot of gotchas associated with um, the particular host architecture implementation. And as we want to make this host architecture agnostic, We've simplified the coherence, sorry, the, the, the address translation protocol and moved a lot of things to the host. So if you compare it with like PCIe ATS, we've actually made things quite a bit more host agnostic than uh, PCIe ATS due to some things we learned about it ourselves. So very simple um, translation model. The other side of things, which is, which is quite, quite useful, is you can build an accelerator that knows nothing about address translation with this protocol. So you can use completely um, effective virtual addresses throughout your accelerator. And that has a lot of very strong advantages. So imagine you're building an accelerator. You want to have lots of parallelism. You want to have a thousand you know, um, little parallel accelerators all working together. And if you think about like an L1 cache, what's a big part of the L1 cache's job is to be able to service high, high request rates. Right? The, an L1 cache has to hold on to the data, but it's also highly ported. Now, now imagine building a thousand ported L1 cache. That's very difficult if that, ad, if that L1 cache has to do with physical addresses. If that address cache is virtually addressed, you don't have to translate every time you look up your L1 cache. And so if you think about you know, architectures, CPU architectures that used to have 
effectively virtually address caches, right, there were some advantages there, but those advantages become even much more significant once you talk about highly parallel accelerators because of the overhead of translation is, is really quite unfortunate. And so the nice part here is we can build accelerators that don't know anything about address translation. We send across the wire, everything's virtual, right? So um, pretty cool stuff that we're doing with, with Open Cathy. So what does it look like from an arc, you know, a stack perspective? It's fairly similar to what you would see with PCIe. The difference is in the, the thickness of the layers. And um, so you've got transaction layer, data link layer, that does all your data replay stuff. You go down to your phi, your serial link. And then we have different DL and TL, data link, transaction link, on the accelerator side. And these are different, once again, because it's an ace, it's a, a, asymmetric protocol. So these are, DLXs are actually quite similar because they both have to do replay in the same way. But the transaction layer on the AFU side, is, on the accelerator side, is, is very simple. So this lets us build very simple accelerators, very thin layer on, on the device. We've actually built, um, we've, we've built these items here onto a Xilinx FPGA. The utilization of LUTs is like, you know, 2%. So it's quite low overhead on, the, uh, on a Xilinx FPGA. So the cost of doing this is very small, and then it's just all putting accelerator to, accelerators down with the rest of the logic. And it talks about that. I forgot. So yes, if you guys can read all that, that says what, uh, what I just said. It will be in the charts. Um, this is kind of unique here, the, the way things look upon the wire. One thing you get with PCIe is the flits can start on arbitrary boundaries. And if you take a 25 gig signal and turn that into the internal FPGA frequencies, the FPGA is running much slower. And so that eight wires of on the interface running at 25 gig looks like 64 bytes internally to an FPGA. And the problem you have with sending something from PCIe over to an FPGA is a command could start on any byte, right? Any of these 64 bytes. And so if I want to find a command, I have to scan across all 64 bytes internally. And the same thing with data. When my data comes in, I've got to rotate it to send it where it needs to go. So I have to build these complicated data rotators, which is difficult for by 8 PCIe, but we're looking at building by 16 open CAPI, right? And so to build a 128 byte wide rotator in an FPGA is latency, and it's also design complexity. And so what we did was we said we need to force things on an even uh, multiple. So we have these 64 byte flits here where the data as it arrives from the CERTES will always be aligned to these 64 byte flits. And beyond that, you put commands in a 64-byte compartment as well, but what does that force you to do? That makes it to where you put multiple commands in a flit. And so with PCIe, you send command and write data is always on the tail of it. With here, you actually send, they're decoupled. The commands are decoupled from the data. So you send a pile of commands, and the data shows up in sort of FIFO order. So quite a bit different than PCIe. Um, it does let, it, let us get very high efficiency because we can put sort of an arbitrary amount of data up to eight flits of data behind one CRC encode. And so as the machine becomes more busy, we actually get more efficient with our CRC because we can pile, we can basically get eight ninths efficiency of our CRC. If the machine isn't busy, then we can send a smaller amount of content. So this is like you, in PCIe, you get one CRC per command. Here you can actually share that CRC across multiple commands and that improves your efficiency. But only, you know, when you're essentially you know, bottlenecked on the interface, does it actually push that level of efficiency? So um, there's some interesting content here where the CRC for a command goes immediately with it, um, and the data, the CRC for the previous stuff is uh, put in the same thing. There's some, it, we'll have some specs on this that will be released. If you become a member of the Open Cappy, you'll be able to see them now. Um, 25 gig phi, point here is this is a good starting point, right? It's not like DDR memory that's like on its last legs, maybe it'll get to DDR5. We're at 25 gig, we have uh, sight lines to 32 and 56 gig off the same uh, differential. It's similar to an Ethernet standard. Um, and every device vendor we've talked to has, always, has been able to run uh, this, this, this 25 gig phi. So we've talked to mm, 10 different devices and everybody's been able to support this. So very standard 25 gig thing, nothing really particularly special about it. Uh, programming model, you know, essentially what we have here is 
Uh, it should be mentioned that you can have host memory, you can have accelerator memory. They're all mapped into the address space. Same old, so they all land at the same virtual address space. Um, we've got atomics, so if an accelerator wants to go sort of process in memory on the host memory, we can send an atomic operation in both directions. Um, there's some ways to communicate quickly between threads that are built into the protocol as well. But fairly, you know, rich set of commands. You, you know, virtual addresses across the whole memory space, DMA reads and writes, cacheable reads and writes, um, also atomics. So, and all these are sort of modable. If you don't want to support atomics as a device, you tell the host that, and then the host will send down atomics as, as its own special, you know, read and write operations. So. Okay, uh, this is worth talking about. So um, FPGAs are great. They're dynamically reconfigurable. Um, very good. The only problem with FPGA is their, um, you know, the frequencies are low and the cost is relatively high in high volumes, right? So it's a bit of a trade-off. So we do have some interesting things we're doing here working with some of our partners is to build these structured ASICs. And so a structured ASICs for open CAPI would be an ASIC where we put maybe some hard IP blocks for the open CAPI interface and then put a bunch of random logic cells across the chip and baked a bunch of wafers with that. And then what you can do is then you can take those wafers and put the higher levels of metalization that are customized for a particular application and then print out a bunch of ASICs, right? So you don't have to pay all the development expense of an ASIC because it's not a custom ground up ASIC and the turnaround time is also very quick. And so significant cost reductions are possible with this where you take your accelerator, maybe you developed it on an FPGA and you said, I like it, I want to go build, you know, 100,000 of them. This would be much cheaper than buying uh, 100,000 FPGAs. And that number is probably actually quite a bit lower than 100,000. So uh, very high performance, so kind of an interesting point to set. You can also build an ASIC, obviously, like a, a networking person, um, like Mellanox is not going to necessarily, you know, FPGA, they'll do an ASIC, but they already have an ASIC. If you're somebody trying to accelerate your workload, um, this gives you an interesting option. Uh, one point, just the way you'll first see this from a development perspective is we have the um, open CAPI interface, and this is actually may or may not need to be there, the, the sort of sideband stuff. This is for boot up and discovery. That's kind of device dependent. But essentially, we've got a 25 gig plug that sits on the motherboard. If you look at like uh, Google's uh, Zaius board, um, you'll see some pictures. There's a little plug on there. Um, that's what this is. And you can send that to, uh, the first thing we built was a PCIe card. We took a Xilinx F, you know, PCIe FPJ card. We used PCIe for power and to hold the card in there and then put some connectors on here to talk our high frequency stuff to the FPGA. This is kind of the first embodiment, but clearly there's going to be a wide variety of form factors. Um, you can imagine there might be a memory dim form factor for people who just want to put DRAM on this device. Um, we have this cabled connector. Um, so you can see there's going to be a couple different ways to attach OpenCAPI depending on you know, what you're trying to do. Right, so this is just one. I probably could put a dim picture as well. Uh, and that's what I have. Are there questions?